You, you get a feel for it, and I think because I grew up working strictly on tape, that you were very defined. You only had 24 tracks, and you know, I know in years before me, you know, it was 16 tracks and 8 tracks. I mean, look what the Beatles did in 4 track. I mean, it's amazing. So we had 24 tracks to work with, but it came to a point, okay, we've only got two tracks left by the time we have the drums and the bass and everything else on there, and we're doing guitar solos. Well, you only get two different takes. So now you got to decide, is one or two better? Well, I'm not sure it's there yet. Okay, we have to erase one of them. Okay, I think two's a little better than the first one. Let's So you erase that. So you're deciding as you go, whereas with Pro Tools, you don't need to make that decision. But I, I, you know, I almost think that these guys, you know, some of these guys up and coming should try either recording on tape or saying, I'm limiting myself to this many tracks and let's get it done in, in this and decide. Because really that's what recording a record is, is deciding what's going on. I mean, sometimes I get sessions to mix that are 280 tracks and nothing's been decided you know one guitar part will be spread across six or seven track all these different microphone combinations I can do it but it's gonna take me a long time and I'm not positive what they were going for when they're recording it whereas when you usually record and you're going for a sound oh, that's, oh that sounds great and you, that's what everybody plays off of well that balance they had now is no longer on my session everything's at zero level so now I've got a try and think well what, what were they looking for here why would they have this room mic here and you know so uh, uh, people just have to decide what's the take you know they're usually pretty good with vocals like you'll usually get a vocal comp but you'll still have another 20 tracks of vocal oh just in case you wanted to change it well i'm mixing it i'm not producing it you know people are now getting used to the sound of mp3s and and that's sort of how everything's judged like the other day uh on black ice we they, they're doing a vinyl run of it so they sent me the the lacquer um, refs to just make sure that it was okay so I had to find had to first find a <laughs> turntable somewhere so we found one at the studio we bought a new uh, cartridge for it new needle and stuff and so I put this thing on I had the CD copy of the record so I started them at the same time just to a B it and I have forgotten how good vinyl sounds compared to the CD it's like oh so what, what my point is, is we're just losing our our sound quality and we're getting dumbed down and dumbed down and dumbed down. You know, to, we're on CD and now we're on MP3 and everybody's, you know, listening to little earbuds and little computer speakers. And that's what music's being judged on now. Nobody's got the big home stereo system anymore. Nobody can really, you know, we're still making it so that it's this full quality, but there's less and less people really care. Oh, I'll just go on the Internet and download an MP3. Oh, that's good. I've got the record, you know. So, you know, I think at some point, hopefully, it starts coming back up again, and people start realizing the quality that there that can be there, and 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 the experience of listening to music that's that sort of full bandwidth, and like, ah, oh, why is this? You know, I one of my sons says, you know, why does music uh, from you know the seventies sound so much better than the music today? And I said, well, partly because the people really played the stuff. And I said, just the way it's recorded, you know, recorded on analog tape and all taken care because you had to take care to not wa watch your levels. And, you know, just just the process was such, to me, a better better way of doing it. It was amazing. I was at one of the mastering places uh, mastering a record I had just done. And the uh, mastering engineer had just been finished doing a, a movie soundtrack where he had a bunch of different... Uh, songs from different bands in and one of the ones it was a, a dean martin song that was recorded in the early 60s and he says oh he says mike he says you gotta gotta listen to this he says i gotta play this for you and it was just the full of the fullness of the sound and it was you know the, the top end and the horns were nice and sparkly and then the bass was just this big bottom end, and it just had this great sound and he says it was only recorded back in those days on one microphone so they just placed everybody around and that's how they got their balance right and then uh, I'm assuming maybe Dean had a separate mic, but it was all basically done live and in the in the room, and you know he just mastered. So we were talking about sort of the downfall of sound quality was the invention of the electric guitar, because now that that needed to be amplified, now we need to amplify that. Now the voice needs amplifying and everything. So now instead of hearing the instruments at their pure stage or state, 
you actually what you're hearing is the amplified version of that so now you're hearing all the tubes and the circuits and and so now that everything's got to be louder and louder and louder and that's kind of where we've got with the cds nowadays there's quite a talk about we've gone way past you know like we're in land of just it's just flatlining on everything just so that it's apparently louder you know it's what do you do no when i'm mixing it's usually just me in my room and i, I sort of prefer it that way only because i can kind of do my thing on it spend the day on the mix it's usually a, a song a day and then at the end of the day they could come in with fresh ears and hear here's what it, and hear what the whole picture is and they're better able to then say oh the vocal sounds a little quiet or can you move my guitar up a little bit or you know a couple little little tweaks but they're not sort of drawn into all day long with my vision listening to the kick drum soloed all day kind of thing they can just come in and listen to the finished result and and it, it's less wear and tear on them and and easier on me I don't like people looking over my shoulder and and oh how come the guitars is well I'm not doing the guitars right now I'm working on the drums and you know it, it can too many cooks can kind of spoil it you know what I'll usually do is I'll just kind of put all the faders up sort of zero level and then I'll, I'll loop the song for a little while and then I'll do a real quick sort of rough balance and, and then I'll let it loop for a little bit and you know let the music try and tell me where it wants to go and you'll you know sort of figure out okay those guitars yeah they need to be really big in the chorus there and all the verse guitars need to have and you sort of get a little vision in your head of what it's like uh, some bands will send you a little quick rough mix um, you know for panning ideas or whatever you know you don't know if George is supposed to be over here and Peter's over here or what so it's you know that little rough mix thing always helps with with their sort of placement but I usually do get the song up and then I'll start EQing uh, I know when I had first started in this business you know I think okay I'll solo the drums and make the drums sound as good as I can okay turn those off now make the guitar sound as good and everything could sound great on its own you try and put it together and it won't mesh mesh together if you do it as a whole it meshes as a song it sounds great if you'd solo the drums or solo the guitar you probably think, oh gee that's not right but for some reason tonally they all fit together really good so I do like to have everything especially the vocal I turn the vocal on really early on you know just have drums and vocal for a while when I'm when I'm working on that because the vocal is to me the main thing everything else has to wrap around it you know I don't try and have a sound I don't like to imprint it on a band I like to be pretty uh, transparent as far as that because I want the band to sound like them you know I want ACDC to sound like ACDC they don't need to sound like Metallica uh, and vice versa I've been trying to sp spread myself into different genres you know doing uh, Nor Nora Jones and Elvis Costello and and this because a good engineer is a good engineer and you know just because I mix heavy bands doesn't mean I can't do a piano based record either you know so in terms of that I like to be fairly transparent you know I've been told you know they say oh I can tell your drums sound a mile away I I don't know I haven't I haven't heard that or I can't I can't you know when a song comes on a radio I would say oh that's my drum sound or they I don't know I just try and make the band sound like the band well the last uh, maybe eight years of sort of consciously tried to stay and work at home more in Vancouver um, and we've got a lot of great studios in Vancouver. We've got Mushroom and Armory and the Warehouse. And there's a great little place. I love doing drums at a place called Rock Beach, which is sort of a little outside of the city on the ocean side. And there's a lot of great things. I've sort of gravitated to working out of uh, the warehouse. I've got uh, uh, the 9000, SSL 9000 in my mix room up there. And I've just been just booking that kind of steady. And it's nice because I can kind of leave everything set up. I've got, I don't know if you've got pictured my control, but I've got flag skulls and crossbones and all that stuff. Just to make it more clubhousey, you know, and just it has sort of a vibe to it. So I've got all, everything all set up. and. And it's just sort of comfortable. It's almost like home now. So, you know, I'm not exclusive there. You know, I love spreading it around and working the different studios. It's just you get on a roll and one project kind of bleeds into the next one. And it's just so much easier to just stay in one one spot and away you go rather than, you know, you know now move over here, move over there. Uh, I love traveling a lot too. Uh, worked out of LA a lot in New York and, and here in London and that. But home, you know, I've got four kids and it's just, it's just nice to be at home and sleeping in your own bed every night.
Well, we recorded in Vancouver, a place called the Warehouse Studios. Uh, that's where we did uh, Stiff Upper Lip. It's been about nine years between records, which is quite a while. You know, they were kind of holed up for a while in London writing this record. Um, took We started beginning of March, and we're all done, recorded and mixed by the end of April. So it was eight weeks almost to the day, which is pretty quick for them. Uh, you know, I'd say on an average, a lot of bands maybe spend, you know, four to six weeks on a record. But for ACDC, you know, they've got the time and, ex you know, they can spend up to three months on a record. So, you know, eight weeks was pretty quick. This right. is the fourth record I've done with ACDC. Uh, and they're usually pretty much live, e every record I've done with them. They go out there, everybody sets up, everybody plays on it. Uh, Brian will quite often just kind of sing on his handheld in, in the control room. And, uh, you know, we go through the song, you know, three or four times, take, you know, maybe record three or four takes, and each take you can feel just a little bit better, a little bit better, and then they'll peak, and then we'll do one more take. It's like, oh, that's not quite as good. Okay, we've got the take. And we usually just use that take. There's hardly ever any editing. I, I remember on Stiff Upper Lip, there's one song. We said, oh, take two, just the ending felt a little better. Let's put that on take three didn't really work. I mean, you couldn't notice the difference, but they could notice the vibe change. So they're pretty live. And then we'll go back and uh, and obviously you know, sing Brian over top and have him do his vocals. And then Angus does his leads and any little fiddly bits and that. So they're a live band. Brendan O'Brien came in and produced on this record. And you know he's quite an accomplished guitar player himself. So it really made sense. He could really talk guitar music with these guys and I think that was one of the reasons they brought him in. Uh, so they'd come in with the sa the songs just on their little computers or whatever and play it to Brendan and they'd go through it just before we started tracking. Maybe trim a little bit of the arrangement down a bit but it was usually pretty close to how the band had it. Uh, they'd work out what tempo felt best. They'd sit there with guitars and just kind of work out and they'd click it off with a, a metronome. And then uh, and then we feed that to Phil, the drummer, and uh, he gets the tempo in his head. We turn off the click. They don't do anything to click. It's all how they feel it, you know. And so that's sort of how it went. There'd be a lot of spaces in between. Um, they smoke maybe three packs a, a day each and tons of tea and coffee and lots of sitting around and yak and politics and et cetera. And then, oh, let's do another take. Then it'd be a flurry of activity for maybe a half hour or so get another take of the song and take a break again. So it's pretty easy going, but but Brandon really kept things moving along. He didn't let the breaks get too long uh, and people cooled down too much. You know, he just kind of kept moving along. And that was one of the reasons it was so fast. But those guys are so great at playing that, you know, all, all we're trying to do is get the magical take. We don't have to work at getting a take. I've got a really good crew together. My assistant's uh, Eric Mosher, great, great kid. So in between in these breaks, that's when we'd get the drums all dialed up again. And, and then, so when the band's ready to go, we're ready to go. So no, at no time are the band or the producer waiting on us. We're always, as soon as you're ready to go, let's go. You know, there's sometimes a headphone would stop working and then we'd, you know, but you know, how do you, you know, it's, it's, things break sometimes, but we're always ready to go. If uh, the guitars needed strings changing, they've got their guys to do that. So, you know, the band would go off or even be sitting there having their cup of tea and smoking it and we're, you know, going around. We don't, ever, we don't really take the break. Once we're ready, then we can take a break and sit and chat. But, you know, we're always go, go, go because uh, I like to, to capture that magic. You have to be ready for it, you know. And whenever somebody's picking up an instrument, whenever they're doing something, we're always in record too, because, you know, they say, oh, let's just run, don't bother recording, well, let's just run it through. That's the one that's gonna be magic. So I always get it, you can always erase it or delete it, but you can't re-grab it if you miss it. So that's one thing I tell all these young guys too, always in record. fourth record I've worked on with ACDC and every time they are pretty much live. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> we'll need a new interviewer, please. Take three. <laughs> um, Sorry, just to start again.